This is Reasonable Doubt with your hosts, Mark Garrigus and Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. No choice, but get on. Mandate. Get it on and welcome to the best hour or so, because Mark's got a heart out. He's got a reservation at Nobu tonight. <laughs> In the universe, it's reasonable doubt of Adam Carolla. He's in uh, Mark's in I'm Chicago. I'm in Chicago, Illinois for top secret hearing, which I I'm not allowed to talk about. Isn't that the worst when I can't talk about stuff? I just hate that. At some point, I'm just going to have to segue out of the law so I can just talk about everything. <clears throat> You're there with uh, your client Jesse Smollett, who Dude, I missed Juicy last night. Um, he he showed up. We were at another restaurant, and he showed up like according to. According to the gang, he was there three minutes after I left. But he was flanked by our team going into the top secret hearing today. So um, the team was there. We were there. I can't talk about it. But we can talk about, you know what we can talk about? Hmm. Britney Spears. Oh, yeah. You know the best thing about Britney Spears is, is that it is united both the left, the right, and the ACLU. I, whoever, who would have thought that Britney Spears would have brought the left, the right, and, and the ACLU together? I yeah. might be able to break some news for you guys. In the last 10 minutes here, the, the news came out that the judge has ruled she can hire the lawyer she wants, Matthew Rosengart, who has stated that he is you know, going to help her end the conservatorship. So yeah, which, which, They filed a brief today, didn't they, Gary? I think I saw that somewhere. The ACLU filed a brief. Which, by the way, what Adam and I have been saying for about, uh, I don't know, four shows, um, that I, it, it's hard for me to believe that you surrender your Sixth Amendment rights totally to even question the fact. I mean, even if you're 5150, you get a lawyer that uh, can try to get you out of a 5150. So I understand the conservatorship is kind of a... Um, a catch legal catch 22 but i suspected and i think we had said that uh this judge who i've appeared in front of uh, fairly recently this year and i like a lot i thought she was going to do the right thing and it sounds like gary you just broke the news that she did is um I, what's the criteria for the conservatorship and i i know it's elastic and it probably moves and maybe it's in the eye of the beholder but She's been in a stable relationship for X number of years. She hasn't gotten any trouble with the, the IRS or missed any uh, dental appointments. Uh, at what point do you just go, well, this person is functioning? I mean, it, it, and, and sort of like we have probation. You commit a crime, you go to prison, you get, or you don't, and you go out on probation. But eventually the probation ends if you don't get a bunch of DUIs and domestic battery charges, you just, you're done with your probation. You've, you've strung together enough good years that we now release you from this probation. I read read today, I think Harmeet retweeted and I wish I had kept the name of the woman who did the investigation, the billing by the lawyers involved. uh, And I think we had talked about this and here was some proof of it. The, um, Harmeet was a little snarky, um, and I think probably had reason to be. The billing, they it was 500 hours under the title Media Matters, meaning dealing with media or media-related things, and and um, and they were paying um, the amounts of money that were going out um, were unbelievable, uh, and so I think unfortunately that sometimes there's this momentum that just keeps going in things when they're, when somebody's feeding, you know, and they're billing away and they're getting paid, you know, the, uh, the billable hour um, is an awful thing. Sometimes it has a, one of the reasons I always think contingency has more value um, in terms of if you create value, you get a value, but you know, the contingency and the work contingency work has got such a bad uh, rap as compared to the billable hour, which uh, you've heard me say it before. I mean, you hate your lawyer after your, I don't care who you are. Uh, you hate your lawyer after the second bill. Do what is uh what do you reckon 500 hours is in terms of billable hours? Uh, what, what is, look at this 500 K for media matters. Uh, uh, and 1.5 Holland and Knight for the last eight months. 
Uh, Liz Day, there you go. She's the one who posted this. And there's some, there's, uh, do you have, um, do you have um, Harmeet's, uh, there you go, 188 grand for the appointment of a trust. The Bessemer Trust was, I believe, said that they never actually did any work on this case, um, which was kind of interesting. Took 188 grand to get them up to speed to not do any work. Um, and this is all coming out of, Britney Spears's pocket. I mean, ironically, yeah. she's funding the case against her. I think I could be mistaken, but I think there was even that somebody billed for writing a cease and desist letter to her. And if that's the case, that really is to quote um, Dershowitz. That's the height of chutzpah. Can you imagine you're spending her money to write her? a cease and desist letter, which is just wild. I mean, you'd think somebody would have said at that point, wait a second here, maybe we'll just pro bono that one. Is her lawyers, or sorry, not her lawyers, but the the ones, I guess, representing her dad or, or the trust, um, you talk about all these billable hours for media stuff. So this is a, a campaign that's being waged in the, the hearts and the minds of Americans. Like, how do you even justify the media stuff versus the nuts and bolts of a case? You know, that's a very good question, because I know that a lot of the large firms now will, they've got departments that are called crisis management, and they will bill out for crisis management. And I assume Media Matters is just a soft-pedaled way of saying crisis management. So when, for instance, the documentary comes out and they're starting to get under siege and all of this uh, stuff is starting to be exposed, then there's going to be, um, uh, you're going to get phone calls, you're going to get all kinds of press inquiries, you're going to get, uh, you're going to, uh, I know I've seen billing, for instance, to clients for people who do the clipping services of all the media surrounding it and things of that nature. So this, this becomes part and parcel of the new world order that we live in. Um, the part that's yeah. the part that's in that uh, that I think infuriates people is you would never you would never have this kind of thirteen year operation if there was not I mean I just think it's without uh, without question if she wasn't an earner and it fits in as we've said before with your kind of your your earner philosophy of life uh, earners versus non earners empty uh, bags. Right. The empty bags, right? I mean, that's yes. the, the how else are you gonna how else how else are you gonna justify? Nobody is gonna be sitting there doing pro bono work for thirteen years to uh, look after um, Britney Spears if she didn't have tens of if she wasn't earning tens of millions of dollars. And um I I think you know the I, I had seen before prior to the um the Hulu documentary that Adam Streisand, who's a lawyer in LA, well thought of, had tried to uh, get in and become her lawyer. Either she had reached out to him or somebody had recommended, and they wouldn't allow him uh, in because under the conservatorship, you may not be um, credible, competent, um, uh, or of sound mind in order to select your own lawyer, which um, is kind of, I mean, there's just, there's various areas of the law that are peculiar, and this happens to be one of them. I mean, if you've got a, if you're charged with a criminal offense, you can get a court-appointed lawyer, but you can also uh, reach out and hire your own lawyer when there's a loss of liberty. Here you've got not only a potential a loss of liberty, you've got a potential loss of your economics. And um, in the idea that somehow your Sixth Amendment rights and your reproductive rights could be impacted by that, you strike people is bizarre. But I looked at the code and they're, they're clearly under the code is support for it. So I, it's one of these things where uh, you, you got to hope that you've got, like we apparently have here with this judge, uh, somebody who did the right thing. Well, what does the judge do? I mean, obviously, her side is saying, I don't need this conservatorship. And the other side is saying, oh, you must. It's important because of safety, financial or not, decisions being made. 
they're going to mount a case. But what what case are they mounting? I mean, she's essentially, in my mind, it seems like she's been hanging with her boyfriend, playing a few shows in Vegas, and then going back to videotaping herself dancing in her home. I think her house burnt down or something burnt down uh, not too long ago, which is probably not a good a, a good look for her re- revoking the conservatorship. But at some point, doesn't the judge just have to go? It's been thirteen years. I don't. I don't think there's enough here. Well, I think what the the apparatus that gets set up. In uh, in conservatorships is you've got people who get appointed by the court who will assess the mental state and say whether or not the the mental state is such that they can handle their own affairs. The the kind of unique situation here is that not only is she a high earner, she's also relatively young. Normally, conservatorships. Uh, would be you when you think of conservatorships with in high profile situations, it's usually usually at end of life. It's a Casey Kasem, it's a uh, Glenn Campbell, it's a BB King. Um, end of life, there's a substantial estate. Whether it's a um, current earning power, clearly there are royalties coming in um, in in those cases that I just mentioned, and monies that have to be managed, and otherwise uh, you would assume would be mismanaged. And maybe, you know, the off times you will see a second or a third wife fighting with a child and and talking about access. Stan Lee was another one recently where there there has been a conservatorships and fights arising out of that. And so that's normally what the 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 system, if you will, is kind of built to address. That's the that's the kind of end of life uh, solutions. When you start getting into this situation where you've got somebody who's of a fairly young age who is an earner uh, and and can earn the kind of money that generates um, lawyers' fees in the millions of dollars in order to uh, service it, it, that's that's I think probably exposes something that the system was never designed to deal with. That seems like a really compelling argument. I mean, I feel like what you just said basically saying this wasn't even designed for this application. And can you name me other contemporary celebrities that are in the same situation? I mean, you know, we all know celebrities can be batshit crazy. There's substance issues. There's all kinds of mistakes being made. Yet there's no conservatorship for, I, I you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I cannot think of you know, Johnny Depp doesn't have a conservatorship. He makes a lot of money and he makes a lot of bad decisions, but he doesn't have a conservatorship. And, you know, you could have said that about Michael Jackson. You could say that about half your clients. <laughs> I mean, they all need a conservatorship, but the point is that it, it doesn't really apply in, in well, this. I have, I'll have two, I have two observations on that. I have the, it's interesting when you say about the clients, because, uh, and I think I've mentioned this to you before, they, uh, the the fine line between kind of artistic genius, if you will, creative genius. Yeah, Kanye and, West could use a conservatorship, right? I'm uh, they, 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 that there's a very fine line, and if that's the case, um, why is it that it's her? And as you say, not Johnny Depp. It's funny you mentioned Johnny Depp because a um, female reporter acquaintance of mine today uh, accused the or said this was a sexist. Um, uh, driven thing that and used Johnny Depp, invoked Johnny Depp as well. Said why, why not Johnny Depp, who famously has had managers ripping him off? If you believe what his allegations have been in his, um, yeah, or in, Mike in Tyson, you, you Mike know, Tyson yeah, it is, head. it is kind of sexist, and that you know the little lady knows not what she does. We need to sort of need a steady male hand to to guide her. But yeah, I didn't even think about the fact that it's been 13 years. Uh, well, you know, the only comparable situation, I'll give you one. In fact, when I first got hired by Mike Tyson, it was a number of years ago where he was uh, he was in a bankruptcy for just a uh, an unbelievable amount of years where his earnings were limited um, by decree of the the kind of the settlement agreement that he was wired into and for a a prolonged period of time. And it was equally as 
um, as kind of onerous on him. And we finally were able to get him out of that. Um, but uh, these situations where you've got somebody who can earn money, um, unfortunately, can sometimes go awry. Um, so predictions. So first off, timeline. When do they wrap this thing up? And then what do they say when they wrap it up? I think the, uh, as Gary says, um, the lawyer will be allowed to substitute in, which I think makes sense because the previous lawyer had done a motion to withdraw. So obviously the court's going to kind of lean towards making sure that there's a seamless transition. Then I think what's going to happen is you'll have a, yet another evaluation or maybe two or three, depending, uh, mental health evaluations. And then um, probably you'll put together or he'll put together a structure that will say, look, here is a structure which uh, will ensure that we can segue out of a conservatorship or lessen the terms of the conservatorship. And I think it'll happen relatively quickly. Um, all right. Then there's uh, Epstein in a little black book. Right, Gary, I was going to ask. I haven't looked today because I've been squirreled away. Have we had any names out today? I didn't see anything new today. I, I believe that the the one that we talked about on Beyond a Reasonable Doubt was kind of the big name that came out of that book. But I was also seeing that there are several different books. The books that you're talking, the book that you're talking about, is a 1997 date book with like 356 entries, I believe. And there's a couple of other ones. One that had over 1,100, and another one that was, I think, seven or 800. So there's a lot of different names that I'm sure are going to come out. The 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 let's just talk about the the concept of the date book um it's just is this just an old school phone numbers book or is this a keeping records of book it appears to be phone numbers and addresses like very you know before smartphones people had to carry that stuff around written down and it seems like it was just strictly that it had you know home numbers and office numbers and occasionally an address we didn't have a rating system next to it or <laughs> no no star system no my no. grandmother had this old for a million years, she had this metal cased thing, and you would slide the metal arrow down to the letter that you wanted. Oh, I, and then the thing would lift up. It would up pop with, up. It yes. would pop up, and it would take those cards up. I remember those. Yes. But nobody has any idea what we're talking about, <laughs> but it was the coolest thing. You would slide it down to the letter, right. like a P, and then it would open up, and you would have a list of all the Ps. The last names with P. Ingenious. So uh, we'll put that on, on hold for now. One thing I wanted to hear mm. your guys' thoughts on is the Richard Sherman story that's breaking today. I'm not sure if you're even aware of this, Ace. DB, okay. Richard Sherman? Yeah, he's currently a free agent. He played seven years with Seattle. In the last three, he's been with, um, he's been with San Francisco, and he's a, a vice president of the NFL Players Association. Apparently, he was at his in-law's house attempting to get in, and they called the police, and... Uh, when the police showed up, they were trying to engage with him. Simultaneously, the highway patrol found a ve found damage to a pylon on the freeway and then subsequently found off the next exit a severely damaged vehicle with wheels all screwed up and everything messed up. They ran the registration, and it was Sherman. So it is presumed that he walked from that location to his in-law's house. And when the cops got there, he was very uncooperative, and they ended up having to stick a canine unit on him. And wow. he is now in jail for domestic, I believe it's domestic burglary uh, of some sort. And he's not going to get in front of a judge until Thursday afternoon. He was arrested 2 a.m. Wednesday morning. So uh, he's still in jail with no bail, which apparently no bail in for the for the crime he was arrested for is not uncommon. You, you get your bail when you go in front of a judge. So sound like maybe some drunk driving and yes. then uh, took it on. Took it on foot. Took it on foot and then, uh, you know, tried to tried to get in through a window or, or a door or something, and Johnny Law got called. Mm. You, know, the, you don't often hear about people trying to break into their in-laws. It's usually yeah. the other way around. They're heading out, to break, yeah. Right. They want to get out of their in-laws. Tunneling. In -laws. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does remind yeah. me, I did, I did get my car destroyed. Mark, I don't think you've ever heard this one, but uh, I think you'd like it. Um, 
I got my car destroyed when it was parked out front of my apartment a million years ago by a drunk driver, and he just completely totaled out my car. It was an old Toyota hatchback. It was fine. I mean, who cares? But it was totaled. And then the guy took off in his pickup truck, and he was able to get, you know, several hundred yards away in his pickup truck. He had, like, two flat tires and overheated and blah, blah, blah. Then he got out of his pickup truck, and he took it on foot, and they caught up to him the next day or something, but he never got the drunk driving charge because I guess they couldn't prove it because he took off and they didn't find him that night and, you know, wasn't going to blow whatever blood alcohol the next day. And uh, so we found ourselves in court. And um, the one thing I did realize about being in court for the first time is I, I was like 28. That's probably like 28, 29. I remember w- walking up to the bench or to the little picket fence with the gate and Van Nuys, and I asked a question, and I was yelled at to sit down. And it made me realize everyone in court is guilty. It, it, there's no defendant. There's no victim. You're just here. You're getting yelled at. So I, I, I had the thought, which is everyone here is guilty. That, that was number one. You know, my I, I tell people all the time, there is no good credit. There's just bad credit and then just credit. But there's no actual good credit. It had happened a million times where I went, why, why do I have to go through all these hoops? I have this. I've done this. Look at my history. And then the answer is there's only bad credit. There is no actual thing called good credit. There's just bad I'll, credit I'll, and non-bad I'll credit. Stick, I'll stick no carrot. Right. Right. So uh, well, I was getting yelled at, and I realized, oh, everyone here is a criminal. And then we sat there, and the judge looked at the guy who destroyed my car, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, what do you want? And I said, well, you know, high blue book is five grand, and low blue book is four grand. Let's just meet in the middle of 4500 bucks." And the guy who destroyed my car— said, are you kidding me? That car had like four bald tires, paint was chipping, <laughs> the thing was on its last legs. There's no way is it worth medium, you know, mid blue book. And I remember, I remember thinking, wow, the ball's on this guy. Yeah. I thought <laughs> if this guy was Japanese, he would have killed himself years ago. But fine, the ball's, the guy destroys my car and then flees, and now he's haggling with me over a couple hundred bucks. And then uh, I had a manila folder, and I held up the manila folder, and I said to the guy, his name is Kenny, I said, Kenny, this is a folder. This folder is filled with receipts. One of the receipts is for four new tires. Now, we could go back to the judge's chambers, and I could open this manila envelope and spill out thousands of dollars worth of receipts that would make be very painful for you and you would look like a liar or you could just agree to this price and we could get on with our lives and he looked at the folder and said fine but it was great he was like let the baby wow. have his bottle 4500 bucks i thought god where is the dignity then i realized that was the first part of this i i had my epiphany when I realized everyone in the courtroom was essentially a criminal. Then later on, he worked out a payment plan with Van Eyes. And uh, at some point, a few months in, I, I called him up and I said, uh, what's going on with this payment plan? I, I haven't received any money. I don't know when the last time I got, you know, 65 bucks a month for, you know, 10 years. I don't think I've gotten any money in a long time. And Van Nuys Court said, yeah, we don't have any way of keeping track of that. And I said, you don't. Because when I get pulled over, the guy's got a computer in his car and a few taps of his fingers. He can tell me when the car was registered and who it's registered to and how old I am and if I have any priors or uh, any warrants or anything. You have a lot of technology when it comes to keeping track of people you get money from. But the people who you're have the victims money. when you're collecting money, you have no system whatsoever in place to figure that out. There it, used to be a, um, where 
when you would pay restitution, the probation department would take the cost of probation services off the top. So somebody would get ordered to pay, for instance, 10 grand and whatever probation services would be three grand. And this person would pay the three grand. The victim would never get the three grand payment because probation would say for having the guy go and check in, putting his hand on the kiosk at the uh, Van Nuys uh, department, uh, that cost, you know, $400, $400 or something like that. And that gets lopped right off the top. So I, I feel your pain or I know of your pain. I've heard, I've heard this complaint for years. I think they've kind of solved that problem a little bit. Um, uh, judges got very wise to that uh, very quickly. All right. Uh, next subject, I'll do a spot, but Gary can uh, tease I can, it. I can give you guys an update on the, uh, the Kavanaugh case that we've been following out of South Carolina and some potential shenanigans uh, back on the night of the boat crash. Oh, this is not the uh, serial rapist Supreme Court justice? Different Kavanaugh? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's different. When is that guy yeah, going to be indicted on rape charges? I mean, he was, well, that he was guy's, having gang that guy, if you, teenagers. I saw a salacious article about that gentleman today. Oh, really? Yes. In his yes. raping ways? Uh, no. Not exactly, but he's, uh, he's certainly painted as aggressive and dangerous. Oh, wow. Uh, LA Times, New York Times. I think it was USA on Medium.com. All right, we'll get into that. I I laugh my ass off as I told you because when he was a when he was nominated, he did the press conference with his like two daughters next to him. And he's like, "Forget about Supreme Court justice. My most important role is soccer coach to my girls 12 and up soccer league." And I was like, "Why is he pitching this, you know, this feminine first kind of good dad kind of my daughter's kind of thing i was like oh because he's about to be attacked as being a serial (laughs) rapist and that's the way we have to do it these days all right let me tell you first about uh better help reasonable doubt is sponsored by better help online therapy as uh we get to the end of the covid the light at the end of the covid tunnel many are still feeling emotionally out of sorts you may not feel depressed but uh, maybe your relationships are suffering or you're anxious you're struggling in your career you have trouble sleeping you need to talk to someone visit betterhelp.com/reasonabledoubt fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and match you with professional licensed therapists start communicating in under 48 hours via secure weekly video. You can do it on the phone. You can uh, even do uh, live chat sessions. It's easy and free to change your counselor if you need a better fit. It's better help, right, Gary? That's absolutely right. Online therapy is convenient and more affordable than in-person therapy. And our listeners get 10% off their first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash reasonable doubt. That's betterhelp.com slash reasonable doubt. All right. So we so, so I the article I read was if you believe Michael Wolf, who is the author and oft times Trump critic, he's got a new book out and called Landslide, I think is the name of it. And they keep releasing excerpts of it. And the most amazing thing is this guy has been on CNN nonstop for years during the Trump presidency, um, just uh, making all kinds of accusations and and um, and allegations about Trump, and apparently Trump sat down with him and did several interviews. Oh, and, that guy, um, yeah, yeah. You know which one I'm talking mm-hmm. about, and did for this new book. He's written uh, previous ones, and um, in the book, he talks about he, that Trump says he's Trump's very upset that Kavanaugh didn't come to his um, defense during the election um, and take those uh, take some of those cases because everybody told him, if you believe Michael Wolf and believe what Trump had said, that Trump says everybody was telling him to pull. I'll give you Kavanaugh's the exact quote, Mark. Yeah. Uh, quote, I might as well tell you, Kavanaugh, practically every senator called me, including Crazy Mitch, and said, cut him loose, sir. <laughs> cut him loose. He's killing us. He's killing us, Kavanaugh. Really? I had to really try hard there not to do a Trump impression. That's good. Yeah, but, you know, I like the the fact that he calls Crazy Mitch. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that part exactly is where I wanted to fall into it, you know? (laughs) Think about what people underestimate 
is his ability to hang nicknames on people. I mean, he really, you know, little Marco and, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he just had, he had an amazing uh, low energy jab. I was going to say he, low energy. Yeah. yeah. Pocahontas, which you can't say anymore for Elizabeth Warren. I mean, he, uh, you know, old and slow Joe. I mean, he just, he, he, it's an amazing thing. Now they're, now they're, the, the book says he's as disappointed in Amy Coney Barrett and Gorsuch, but he kind of, res it sounds like he reserves his ire for Kavanaugh of all people. Well, it's kind of an interesting psychological experiment and um but you tell me what you think of this mark um nobody is above and 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 uh, let's just talk in broad strokes here but i i'd be curious about this and we brought it up before we talked about that judge who was um in the Bay Area, I think, who presided over the Stanford rape, yeah, Aaron case. Judge Aaron Judge Aaron Persky, right, and, who got recalled and, right. by that by that professor at Stanford, and he just basically said, uh, "Here's the sentencing guidelines. Here's what we got. I did my job, and his life was destroyed." Right, right. So there was a time when the Supreme court were a bunch of, you know, elderly gentry and we didn't know what their home addresses were. We couldn't dox them. We couldn't go after them. There was no, you know, write Write your congressman or something. You know, that's what they would say. Write your congressman. And now there is no escape of the, the scrutiny. You know what I mean? Like if you, if you are, a Supreme court judge and you're like, well, I would like to make uh, abortion illegal throughout the land. Uh, your life might be destroyed ostensibly. Um, and, and vice, and vice versa. Right. 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 And it's, and it, and it's, and it, it touches everyone. We, they get to everyone. I mean, it's like, I was talking about Fauci, you know, Fauci is, uh, immunologist who's supposed to be setting policy for the country. Um, he gets questioned. I mean, I screamed about it at the time, a, you know, a year ago, they're saying, uh, so you can't go to church and you can't go to a ball game and you can't go into a movie theater, but you can march with black lives matter. And he was like, well, I, I have no opinion on that. Well, he has opinions on large groups gathering he just doesn't have an opinion on a Black Lives Matter rally because he's caught in. He's in it. He, he can be touched. They can get to him. He doesn't want to go home and be on the front of uh, CNN with them talking shit or read about a bunch of tweets. So everyone is getting everyone can be reached now. And so if you take a Trump is disappointed in all who he appointed. He's disappointed in in who he appointed Sorry to go Nipsey Russell on your ass because I think there's this phenomenon and you tell me that's a long build up to this. He appoints someone who everyone assumes is um, conservative because Trump's appointing them and that's who's in charge. And then the left screams bloody murder oh this is going to be the end of all the liberties and, and abortion rights and it, it's going to be the end it's going to be the end of everything and then the person has to endure this crazy circus of being confirmed and being called uh, and, and with all the doom and gloom that goes along with it right if this right. if this person is appointed here's what we can look forward to all right then the person gets appointed and then one of these type cases shows up. But the natural human condition is to go, oh, I can't do what they said I was going to do. Then it would confirm all their worst thoughts. They're, they're great. I, I, and so they're like, when you get appointed, all you're going to do is Trump's bidding. You're going to get in there. You're just going to do Trump's bidding. And then they get appointed and then there's some case that comes in and he wants them to look at election laws or voter rules. And, and they go, I can't do that because then I will just be doing what they said I was going to do. And I want to show them that I'm not that person. That's you, interesting because that's not the theory. I've heard two theories specifically on Kavanaugh. Um, and look, my interaction with him many, many years ago was when he was 
um, you know, uh, AKA, pulling a train. AK <laughs> Butt Boy. You're high fiving. During AK <laughs> Butt Boy during white during Whitewater. Um, the um, the the interesting. I bet it was. Era, <laughs> Black Boy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. Like that. Like if I get one of my cases in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and he leans down and, and asks, "Do you remember what you used to call me down in Little Rock?" <laughs> um, so the one theory is is that this is somebody who always has wanted to go along to get along. That he's one of those types. He's a social uh, personality, uh, and that the the that. When you saw that fury, that hurt, that kind of lashing out during the confirmation hearings, that was somebody who could not believe what was happening to him. And all of his efforts since then has been to kind of ingratiate himself or to kind of mend all of that. That's one of the theories. One of the other theories is this was somebody who was not unknown meaning he was on, I believe, the D.C. Circuit, had written many opinions, and if you read his opinions, he's not that far outside of kind of uh, the the mainstream uh, Republican kind of orthodoxy, and what he did at the U.S. Supreme Court in certain instances, you should not be that surprising. And um, But I don't know, and this, once again, I'm assuming, but I assume Trump is not there digesting his legal opinions, um, and he's relying on other people to tell him that. It was probably uh, Don McGahn, who was the uh, White House counsel, who was probably telling him those things, and or telling Trump what he needed to know. Uh, and I doubt that Don McGahn was answering questions like, hey, if their election case gets there, is he going to is he going to move uh, heaven and earth in order to uh, to undo the election? I just don't I don't I don't think Don McGahn doesn't strike me as somebody who would do that. So the one thing theory is it's strictly personality and of who he is and the other that it's that he's got an ideological paper trail that would have been predictive that this is the kind of uh, stuff he would be doing i will tell you another person who um ha, is also that way or is similar to the ideological paper trail is the chief justice john roberts who was always kind of an incremental uh guy um, in terms of um, his paper trail before being appointed and has has tried to at least uh, uh, from the outside looking in, you never know what actually goes on there. But from the outside looking in, you would think he's trying to build the collaboration and not destroy stare decisis and previous opinions and things of that nature. It's just a very, uh, the, it's a very nuanced way to look at it. Then the other there's a, a theory that doesn't apply necessarily to Kavanaugh, but more broadly to the Supreme Court, is that there is a general kind of pull. I've heard this argument for decades, that when Supreme Court justices get in the beltway and they're in that milieu, that they get pulled more to the center left, that, uh, that that's kind of the natural uh, beltway ideology and that that pull will take somebody who you might have thought was going to be maybe right of center and pull them more towards left of center over the course of their career. That was probably most um, uh, illustrated, or at least most recently illustrated by David Souter, who was um, who uh, who uh, ended up voting in ways that they never expected and Roberts have voted in ways as has continued to vote so in ways that um has uh, are unexpected at the very least from people who thought that he was going to be a solid vote on for this kind of ideology. Uh Gary you want to wrap it with that 
other Kavanaugh story? Yeah, I actually misspoke. I think I, that's a, that case. The name is Murdoch. Murdoch. I think I've been Murdoch. reading too much Kavanaugh today. So yeah. sorry about that. Um, you know, obviously that gentleman, Paul Murdoch, who was driving the boat, has since died. But the other members of the, the other people that were in the boat, there are various lawsuits going on, and it's starting to come out in depositions that although the cops were very clearly told that the Murdoch kid was drunk and driving the boat. And they, this is coming out from audio from their body cameras on the night of when they were doing their mm-hmm. interviews. Their reports omit all of that. And mm. they're getting in sticky situations where lawyers are playing them the audio and then showing them the reports. And they're having to try to obfuscate and try to justify why they did not, in fact, put this very powerful family's you know, youngest son's name down. And uh, it's just it's going to it's going to be unfolding on that case. And I also thought it was interesting at the very end of that article, uh, they noted that everyone involved in the boating case had agreed to provide DNA samples to the police for use in the murder case. Mm. Wow. So wow, they, so the really- cops basically went to all these people and were like, look, you know, these people died. Obviously, you're all suing. There's all this stuff. So you're suspects. And everyone agreed, you know, no problem. Here's our DNA. Wow. The uh, story continues. I'm I'm interested in this one. This is definitely going to be. I'm keeping know, a close a, eye on this one. A movie of the week. Um, all right, uh, Mark's got to go uh, eat some yellowtail. And uh, yellowtail, here I come. I will. Uh, you're traveling this week, so I'll let you tell everybody where you're going. Right? Yeah, I'm going to North Carolina. Good Nights Comedy Club in Raleigh. So uh, you can come out tonight. Probably a few tickets left. Doing a live podcast and then a stand-up show as well. You can go to amcurl.com for all the live shows. What do you got, Mark? I've got uh, come up to the Hamptons this weekend as uh, to the Capri. If you want to uh, sweat off a little weight, go down to Palm Springs uh, at the <laughs> V Hotel or San Clemente uh, at Casa Tropicana, downtown Tenny, uh, and Mediterranean Tapas, or Engine Company Twenty Eight. All right, I'll tell you about uh, Geico, last but not least. Do you own, do you rent? Well, you do one or the other, and then there's your automotive policy. How about you get your bundle working with Geico? You take your automotive and uh, policy, and you bundle it up with your homeowners or your renter's insurance. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around the house. So go to geico.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save and just how easy it is to save when you get your bundle working at Geico, that is geico.com. So until next time, this is Adam Carolla for Mark Garagos saying mahalo. Thanks for listening to Reasonable Doubt. Tune in next Saturday for an all-new episode.